Okay. Oh, yeah, it's working. So, now it's okay? So, uh, thank you for the invitation. And actually, I was asking Iberé, you know, what I'm doing here, because I don't work on nonlinear dynamics. I don't know exactly on this area, but I understand that uh, climate change is a very important scientific issue with many uh, ramifications, let's say, to nonlinear dynamic system. And I try to fit my presentation on this interest, but keep it uh, broaden us for everybody to profit from the presentation. So basically, uh, if you're gonna start discussing the history of climate change, uh, we have to start from the beginning. And the beginning was uh, 4.6 billion years ago, where our planet was formed. Then geologically has evolved, in, of course, in a nonlinear way, as all you know. 3.8 billion years ago, life showed up, and then life and geology came together uh, in a long evolution, and we, as, uh, as, as a species, Homo sapiens, just showed up, showed up here 200,000 years ago. It's a very, 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 very short time compared to 4.6 billion years ago. Uh, humans, of course, are present in the very last second of the uh, Earth's history. Uh, but, of course, you are changing the planet in ways that uh, uh, you're going to see it's uh, very, very important. The changes in the planet we are doing can be cat categorized, let's say, in two big blocks. The first one, the trends in socioeconomics. Uh, if you look into uh, real GDP, uh, uh, <coughs> world population, uh, use of uh, water, paper production, inter international tourism, all the socioeconomic indicators mostly goes up exponentially. In a planet with the finite resources, we all know that we cannot continue like that ad infinitum. There is not some uh, such thing like that. And these socioeconomic trends put a lot of pressure on the Earth system trends from temperature, from marine fish capture, uh, shrimp, aquaculture, blah, 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 many, many uh, other pressures on the Earth system that many of them are also increasing exponentially. So, for a, again, for a finite planet, uh, we have to study what will be the impact in our societies of these changes. This is well recognized scientifically, of course, for quite some time already. So this is one of the covers from Nature, defining the Anthropocene, that's a new geological uh, epoch, where it's a time when humans and our civilization become a major geophysical planet force. It's a very strong phrase defining what is Anthropocene. And one important point here, back here, sorry, is that uh, the Holocene, that is the geological time we are living right now, has a very strong characteristics of the last 12,000 years. Very stable climate. This is what allowed us to develop agriculture, as we know right, right now, and allow us to take over the planet. And, and basically, uh, now, uh, we are a major geophysical planetary force. And then this is the cover of The Economist in 2011, Welcome to the Anthropocene. So this is uh, recognized not just by science, but also by economists and social scientists all over the world. So basically, we are taking over the planet, and the main question is, what are you going to do with these new uh, features? One central issue in the climate change is uh, the use of energy in the planet. So basically, this is CO2 emissions in gigatons of CO2 per year. Right now, we are emitting 40 billion tons of CO2 per year. So from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution until recently, so you can see that 80 to 90% of the emissions are actually fossil fuel emissions. And then about 10% is associated with the land use change. 
So uh, basically, if you look to the CO2 emissions only for the last 20 years, you see that uh, besides all uh, Rio 92 conference, uh, Stockholm conference, all the Paris agreement uh, negotiations, what is still growing up in terms of emissions? Uh, uh, 2017 to 2018 was increase of 2%. This year will be an increase in emissions of 2.4% in one single year. So basically, uh, this is a, besides all the negotiations, we are still increasing the emissions in the, uh, of greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. Uh, basically, CO2 is the most important uh, in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by major gases. 62% is CO2, but it's not the only one. Uh, we also have, of course, CO2 from land use. We have methane uh, that is basically produced by agriculture and, and, and pasture activities. We have uh, N2O emissions that is mostly from uh, fertilizer additions to agriculture. So what do you mean that even if you reduce CO2 emission by zero, we still have a significant component associated with the food production that probably we cannot avoid that in a world of 10 billion people in 2050 uh, needing food for everybody. So in terms uh, of greenhouse gas emissions by major source, the last compilations show basically that food and land use is responsible for 24% of the emissions, one quarter, Electricity, industry, and transportation is about 70%. 70 then you have energy for buildings and industries, and so on and so on. You see, it's a pretty complex picture, and it's not easy, will not be that easy to reduce these emissions as uh, uh, defended by the Paris Agreement. So these emissions go to the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a very, very, very small reservoir. 80% of the mass of the atmosphere is in the first 15 kilometers only. The distance between my home to here, that is where 80% of the mass of the atmosphere is. So it's a very small reservoir. If you shoot up uh, 40 billion tons per year, the concentrations must be increasing, and it's increasing. So now it's 414. Uh, parts per million. It was 280 before the Industrial Revolution. So you see that you have a steadily increase in CO2 concentrations. <coughs> CO2 have increased 44% since the Industrial Revolution. Methane increase was 175%. So what this means is that one single species, us, are changing the atmospheric composition. And that is extremely important for several reasons. One of these, the reasons is that some of the trace gases we are increasing absorbs radiation in the infrared part of the spectra. So basically, if you look for absorption spectra of N2O, methane, uh, water vapor, that's a very important greenhouse gas, uh, CO2. And then you see that these uh, molecules absorb infrared radiation, and most of them are transparent into the visible <coughs> radiation. So if they trap outgoing radiation to a space, we uh, end up heating up the planet. It's that simple. So this is not uh, new. So Arrhenius uh, published a paper in 1896 uh, showing calculations using the calculation rule, you know, before quantum mechanics, before everything we know in the last 100 years, uh, predicted in this paper that if you double the CO2 concentration, the planet will heat up by about 5 degrees centigrade. It's very impressive that if you do exactly the same calculation on the biggest supercomputers today, you get exactly the same result, you know. And this is well known to science, so it's nothing new. And this is also well known in the press. For instance, this is a, a newspaper article in 1912, mentioning that at that time they were 
uh, uh, burning about 7 million tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere daily. That was their calculations for daily emissions at that time, mentioning that this will tend to make the air a more effective blanket in the Earth. So this is also well known uh, also in the general press. But basically, what we are changing in the planet is not the atmospheric concentrations, but we are changing in the planet is the Earth's radiation balance. So that is the important business. So we depend, you all know that we depend on 340.2 watts per square meter that arrives every single day in average in the planet. So uh, part of this is reflected by clouds and the atmosphere. Part is reflected by the surface, that is the surface albedo. And most of it is absorbed by the planet to keep life working like, like, as we know. And infrared radiation escape to the, to the outer space. And clouds, aerosols, and greenhouse gases intercept this radiation. And we are increasing this feedback loop in the climate system. This is exactly what we are doing. And this is the critical uh, issue uh, responsible for the increasing in the energy in the atmosphere that uh, feeds the climate, as we're going to see. If you look into the time series of the last 800,000 years of climate history, you see that the CO2 concentrations varied significantly in between 200 to 280 parts per billion. Sorry, parts per million. So you see that every time the CO2 concentration increases, methane also increases, and also you have an increase in temperature and vice versa. So basically, we have a system with the large fluctuations in, in, in temperature, and this uh, can be uh, quite precisely um, uh, modeled with the, with the paleoclimate information. The calculated temperature fits, fits quite well uh, the observations. And the point is, this uh, glacial, interglacial, glacial, interglacial oscillations is, of course, a dynamic complex system, as you all know very well. So the Earth have just oscillated between these two states, you know, uh, in a very more or less predicted way, let's say. But after 1950, something changed in the system. So actually, we changed these trajectories we were following for the last 800,000 years at least, you know. And we are going to a new trajectory that's called the Anthropocene trajectories. That actually we don't know exactly what is that, and we don't know exactly what is called the Anthropocene state. We, what, what we know is that we are following an attractor associated with the greenhouse gas emissions, but you don't know the dynamics of this uh, new system. So that is really a, a very uh, relevant point of uh, research. So basically, if you are moving to the Holocene, that our geological time now to the Anthropocene, basically where we were in a quite stable system. And the issue is that the stability of the system is changing uh, to a new state that we don't know to characterize it properly yet, but we have to do that, you know. So basically we are following up a track uh, in 1950, 1996, we're finally getting out a, a new trajectory that uh, we have to understand much better the transition between the Holocene envelope for natural variability and the Anthropocene that you are entering right now. So that is the association of this area with the uh, complex dynamic systems. And it's also important to know what is happening with the CO2 that you are pumping up into the atmosphere. So uh, right now, 91% of the CO2 emitted to the atmosphere came from fossil fuel burning. 90% uh, came from tropical deforestation, like in Amazonia. We're going to see that later. So when I started studies 35 years ago, this 90% was 19%. So 150 of the 
one fifty of the greenhouse gas emission at that time was deforestation. Now is reduced to ninety percent, but this is too too much. Where the CO two uh, goes to? So thirty one percent is reabsorbed by tropical ecosystems. So with more CO two, if you have the same amount of uh, radiation, water vapor, and uh, nutrients, the plants grows uh, faster. It's not that simple. But basically, it's important to know that there is only one single process to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and this process is called the photosynthesis. There is no other, no process to remove CO2 as fast as you need and as much as we, we want. 25% of the atmospheric CO2 goes to the oceans. So basically, making the oceans more acidic, and 44% accumulates in the atmosphere. So it's this 44% that makes that change I mentioned before. And this sink, and this sink is slowing down. We are having already documentation that, of course, a tree, because of mechanical reasons, cannot grow up 300, 400, 500 meters. It's broken down. And the ocean, the pump that pushes CO2 from the atmosphere depends on the difference of CO2 concentration from the liquid to the air, and this difference is decreasing. So basically, we can expect that in the next uh, few years, actually, this fraction will increase, increasing the uh, issue with the, um, sorry, with the, um, increasing the, the issue of, um, uh, CO2 atmospheric concentration. These movies shows the global distribution of CO2, just for you to have an idea. Uh, so basically, a molecule of CO2 released in the United States in about uh, four or five days is in Europe, in about one week is in China, and in about 10 days goes all over the, the planet. So actually, this is just to, to emphasize the issue that uh, the atmosphere is shared by everybody uh, all living organisms on Earth share the atm atmosphere. And you see that in the southern hemisphere, we have a much lower concentration of CO2. Of course, as CO2 is a long-lived greenhouse gases, in the end, it gets mixed up, and we have a relatively homogeneous CO2 uh, concentrations. The other ingredient in climate change is energy. So this is... Uh, around the world with the energy. We we'll see day and night, day and night. The important feature here is the importance of tropical regions as a redistributor of um, heat in the whole planet. So you see that in the tropical regions like Amazonia and tropical Pacific are absolutely critical in the energy balance. And they are responsible for redistribution of the energy along the temperate regions and for the whole globe. So basically, these are the two main uh, features. So if you have more energy into the system, and if the thermodynamics works, the temperature must be increasing. And this is exactly what is happening. So this is record of temperature. One of the records of temperature, there are many, uh, from, eight, from the uh, end of the Industrial Revolution up to 2016 in this case. So basically, we are heating up the atmosphere by 1.25 degrees in average. And that's a big issue because this is a global average. Global average, you don't live in a global average. If you look to the geographical distribution of the observed temperature increasing, you see that continental areas heat up much, much more than oceanic areas because of the larger heat capacity of water. And you see, for instance, that the, in Siberia and Canada, uh, we already are observing increase in temperature in between 2.5 to 3 degrees. In parts of Brazil, especially the northeast part of Brazil, we have increased the temperature already of 1.5 to 2 degrees. So this is not a negligible increase in temperature. There are important seasonal variability that has impact on the functioning of the ecosystems, as we all know. If you look in more detail here, for instance, for South America, temperature anomalies and precipitation anomalies, you see that the San Francisco Basin and the northeast part of Brazil 
already have heating up by 2.5 degrees. So that's a huge increase in terms of uh, temperature. The eastern part of Amazonia also heated up already by 2 degrees. And also this is followed by a change in the precipitation patterns that is critically important for our society and for agriculture. In the northeast part of Brazil, the decrease was already minus 25, minus 30% in terms of precipitation. So a semi-arid region in the northeast are becoming an arid region. And you see an increase in precipitation in the southern part of Brazil, in the La Plata Basin, that is increasing precipitation by about 30%. So this shift in precipitation, of course, has very important socio-economical impact. The atmosphere is heating up. The ocean is in contact with the atmosphere. So if the atmosphere is heating up, the ocean is also heating up. And it's important, uh, the ocean, because uh, increasing temperature in the ocean decreases the amount of oxygen in the, in, the, in the ocean, uh, and also we are observing an increase in the acidity of the ocean by 30% over the last 100 years. So we are changing quite a lot, not just the atmospheric ecosystem, but also the oceanic ecosystem. If you look at the all changes in, in, in the planet, it's very extensive changes. Uh, we are changing the... Um, um, is no cover, we are changing the uh, level of, of the sea. Sea have increased by 26 uh, centimeters already in average. Some parts of Brazil, for instance, in Recife, the average increase in sea level was already 60 centimeters. So that's a very significant, that put a lot of pressure on infrastructure close to the beaches in the northeast part of Brazil. So, uh, and also the extreme climate events that are happening much more frequently than before. You saw in India uh, 51.5 degrees uh, four weeks ago. You saw in Paris 41.7 degrees uh, two weeks ago. So we are observing a very strong and solid increase in climate extremes. So the question is how to model all this? How to model a such a huge, complex system? That's not an easy task. The first one that you have to understand that uh, the Earth works, uh, we can separate five compartments, but of course they are very closely linked. The atmosphere, the cryosphere, the biosphere, the geosphere, and the uh, hydrosphere. And we are, as a species, in all these five compartments. So you can imagine how complex is to model uh, the, this whole system, especially because the interlinked uh, between all these systems are all nonlinear and very strong, much stronger than we saw just five or 10 years ago. And in order to construct a physical model of the planet, is not a trivial task, as you can imagine. Uh, in the beginning, at least you have to center on radiation, because energy is what drives the climate in the planet. But this is affected by clouds, volcanoes, biomass, ocean CO2, ocean temperature, melting, and so on, in a very, very complex and dynamic system. If, and the, another co uh, complex issue is to take into account all the different scales and all the different components. So you need to go from very small scales where uh, natural emissions with the cities emission, with the industry, with mobile systems, including airplanes, all this goes into the global atmosphere. And that's not a trivial thing to model all these emissions, especially going from this scale to the planetary scale. So the models today are very, very sophisticated tools, uh, but very fortunate. Now we don't have any more too much constraints on computing power, because actually 
we can do this uh, relatively easy. Even Brazil can do that, you know. But basically what we need now is an earth system model that take into account all this component, the atmosphere, the urban land, uh, the process that happens in the land, in the ocean, and all this uh, with the physical constraints. But also, there is one important ingredient that is the most difficult to incorporate into the model, that is our activities. You know? So it's very easy for the physical components, but for the social economic components, it's really extremely difficult to do. And one of particular issues that I work with that is pretty difficult, where most of the uncertainties are is still very important, is the interactions between aerosol clouds and radiation. That is the, by far the largest uncertainty in the climate models because of the very uh, complex feedbacks that you have to take into account. You increase the temperature, you can increase or decrease <laughs> certain types of clouds. This will increase or decrease the scavenging of aerosols and so on. It's an extremely difficult and complex system to model in a global climate system, especially because the, the relevant process are actually very, very small scales. Process of, let's say, uh, one kilometer, five kilometers, that the domain of a cloud, a global model have a grid space of in between the very best 10 to 12 kilometers only. So you have to deal with subgrid process that you don't know how to parameterize properly. And this is a major difficulty yet. We have to find ways to solve this issue if you want to have a more reliable uh, global climate system. But this is an uncertainty in the, in the models, in the physics, chemistry, and biology of the models. But the major uncertainty is actually us. So who could predict, let's say, five years ago that Bolsonaro could be elected in Brazil, or Trump be elected in the United States? So this is by far the biggest uncertainty in climate change research. Basically, uh, where the emissions will go from here, right now we are 40 gigatons of CO2. Are you going to follow this trajectory here, or are you going to follow this trajectory here? We actually don't know. And the difference is just a factor of 100. So then you see that this is actually the biggest difficult. But the climate model makes some assumptions, you know, in terms of trajectories for emissions, from the very optimistic trajectories for the global emissions to the business as usual, where we can heat up the planet by three or five degrees uh, if you continue to emit 40 gigatons of CO2 until the middle, the middle of the century. So IPCC, we developed a, a metric on how to take into account all these very different components it's called radiative forcing of the climate system. And for instance, this is the change in CO2 from 280 to 414 parts per million. So this adds up 1.68 watts per square meter. It's a very, very small amount compared to 240.2. So you see how sensitive the climate system is to changes in the radiation balance. Uh, you have the aerosols that cools down the climate, you have the clouds that also cool down the climate, and the combination uh, for 2011 was an additional 2.29 watts per square meter to the global energy system. Looks very small number, but this very small number is bringing a lot of um, effects like you we are doing, we are seeing right now. And the role of aerosols and clouds, they mask the heating of the greenhouse gases. And they mask the heating of the greenhouse gases. This is a recent paper uh, in science that shows the temperature increase if you phase out all fossil fuel related and all particulate air pollution. Surprisingly, we are heating up uh, the, 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 the global temperature by plus 0.73. Can look contradictory. You is removing greenhouse gases, but you, together, if you remove combustion process, 
you remove a part of the aerosols that are masking the heating. And then in, in the final result, by, you know, it looks very contradictory, we will have a much more significant heating if you reduce the combustion from fossil fuel. And you see that most of the heating will be in the northern hemisphere. So just to, for you to have an idea of the contradic contradictory aspects of climate change. OK, if you look into the future, uh, IPCC do this ensemble of models. Right now, we have 29 different climate models from very different institutions. And this is the average result of the estimate of temperature increase for a very optimistic uh, pathway, a realistic pathway, and the business as usual. So basically, you see that, for instance, in Brazil, uh, in, the, in the business as usual, and also in the, let's say, a more realistic uh, emission scenario, we will have a heating up of 4 to 4.5 degrees. That's a very large increase. In the, in the Arctic, uh, the heating is expected to be about 7, 7.5 degrees. Again, an extremely high uh, increase in average temperature. If you go into more detail, so at INPI, the INPI team does what we call downscaling of these global models, uh, assimilate this data into much higher resolution models, and do more reliable uh, uh, temperature forecast. And this is the result. You see that, for instance, the uh, central part of Brazil can heat up by 5, 6, 6.5 degrees. So that's a huge change. So uh, just going to, to talk a little bit about Amazonia. So Amazonia is, of course, a key component of the climate system. And the forests, in general, are an important component of the climate system. These movies shows uh, how forest goes into the, in, into the atmosphere. So you see uh, spring and summer, then came winter. You see that the boreal forest and the temperate forest are seasonally absorbing and releasing carbon to the system. But you see that the, the tropical forests in Amazonia and in Africa are the only permanent reservoirs of carbon. And Amazonia stores 120 billion tons of carbon that if you deforested significantly the forest, this will be released to the atmosphere. And this is the time series of deforestation uh, in Brazil. Uh, we were deforesting about 28,000 square kilometers in 2003, 2004. This was reduced to 4,000 kilometers in 2011, 2012. So that means, is it possible and easy to reduce the tropical deforestation? Does not cost too much money and can be done if you have the will, the political will, and the resources to do that. But unfortunately, in the last four to five years, deforestation in Brazil is, is still increasing quite significant, 40% over the last five years. And 2019, the number will be closer to 10,000 square kilometers of deforested forest this year. So it's a huge deforestation area that this is still increasing besides all Paris Agreement, besides all commitments. This is not unique for Brazil. So if you look now globally, this is tropical forest cover loss globally. You see that is increasing uh, overall. So. Uh, but Brazil is by far the champion of the deforestation, followed by Congo, followed by Indonesia. So the good news here is that if you act only on three countries of 196 nations, uh, you can reduce 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. And that is cheap, and that can be done in the short term. So basically, uh, Indonesia, Congo, and Brazil can reduce the global emission very, very significantly. The importance of the Amazonia is also critical for the hydrological cycle. So Amazonia process a lot of the water that came from the tropical Atlantic and feeds the agricultural area of southern Brazil. Uh, but Amazonia is changing. 
and it's changing very significantly. If you measure the amount of water that goes out in the mouth of Amazon River, it has increased by about 30% in the last 50 years. So both in the wet season, in the dry season, and in the annual average. Eventually, this is associated with increase in tropical Atlantic sea surface temperature. But actually, the correct answer is to have no idea why the hydrological cycle in Amazonia is intensifying as we are seeing here. There are, it's a very, very complex system. Depends also on the biology of the forest. And we are far from understanding all this. Another important change in Amazonia is the increase in climate extremes. So this is a, a, a compilation since the beginning of last century of uh, big uh, floods and big droughts. And you see that the amplitude between the floods and the droughts are increasing. So we're getting a more uh, extreme climate in the, in yeah. the. Yeah, OK. And then uh, I will skip several of this. Oh, this is important. Um, basically, also, uh, when I started my work in Amazonia 35 years ago, Amazonia was absorbing carbon at 0 0.5 tons per hectare per year. Now it's zero. The net uh, flux of carbon in Amazonia is zero, especially because we are increasing the tree mortality very significantly because of the droughts of 2005 and the droughts of 2010. So basically, as you can see, uh, we, are, uh, we are leaving an uh, equilibrium system here in a, in a pure tropical forest to a mixed system. And in the future, if the savanna and the forested areas become larger than 40%, or the temperature increases larger than four degrees, we can have a, a state where tropical forest cannot sustain itself anymore. And then we lose that 120 billion tons of carbons to the atmosphere in a matter of 20 or 30 years. So it's a increasing the uh, amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, almost doubling this CO2, and then we enter in a completely new uh, climate state. Just to finish, I will skip several slides here. One of the issues that the models can only, uh, the climate models right now, do not take into account the tipping points. So basically are uh, critical states that can change the, the equilibrium of the system. This includes Amazon forest, this includes the thermal line circulation, this includes the West Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland, the permafrost, and so on. And one of the most important components that we are seeing huge changes in emissions of methane from the permafrost. So uh, you saw that last week the temperature in Alaska was 27 degrees higher than the average temperature, uh, historical average temperature. So, this means methane is escaping to the atmosphere, and methane is 25 times stronger to do greenhouse, to, to trap infrared radiation than CO2. So this is a huge positive feedback in the system that is not yet incorporated into the system. And then uh, another important issue that we have is our capacity to produce food for 10 billion people in 2050. This is the, the World Economic Forum from Food and uh, Administration Organization. You see that the percentage changes in yields of uh, food production, look for the map for Brazil and for Africa. So a loss of the food production by 30%, 40%. So this is very problematic because this is where radiation hits the planet, but the temperature can be as so high that it will be very difficult to sustain the um, for the production system. So basically, um, there are solutions, and one of the solutions is reduce CO2 emission. The question is by how much and how to do that. So IPCC 
have uh, released uh, a few months ago the 1.5 degrees report that uh, shows how we gonna we can achieve to stabilize the planet with a maximum increase in temperature of 1.5. In order to do that, we have to decrease the amount of, C of uh, fossil fuel starting 2020 by 5% a year, and then zero the emissions in 2060. And after that, we'll have to capture as much as minus 20 billion tons of CO2 uh, per year in order to stabilize the climate by 2050. It's almost an impossible task, but of course, as close as you get from these kind of scenarios, the better uh, for everybody. So uh, just to finish, the, the most important and the only agreement we have in place is the Paris Agreement. Um, if we all the countries fulfill their intended national determined contributions uh, fulfilled, we still will have a warming of 2.7 to 3, 3 degrees global average. That means continental increase in temperature of about 3 to 3.5 degrees. That is the most optimistic way we can have it right now. But Brazil will not fulfill his uh, Paris Agreement commitments. The same with the United States, the same with Germany, the same with the many other countries. So that is, is uh, where we are uh, right now. I will go to finish. Um, just to mention that the climate change is not the only change that is happening in our planet. It's always important to have a broader view. So in, in order to have this broader view, uh, the world in 2050 in addition to the issues associated with the food, biosphere, and water that we have discussed, we, are, uh, we need to build up smarter cities because 87% uh, of the global population is already, will be urban in 2050. In Latin America, right now, urbanization is 89% of the people. So basically, if we don't find out a way for the people to build more sustainable cities, not like Sao Paulo, for instance, uh, will not achieve uh, anything. And then also the digital revolution, the demography, the changes in consumption and production, and of course, the decarbonization of the whole production system and energy production. So basically, this is the message. That is not an easy task, but is of course an essential task for us, and the scientific community will have to work extremely hard to fulfill the needs of the society in the very important uh, climate change issue. Thank you for the attention. We take one question, and after that, I'm sure Professor Arnaxo yeah. will be available to us. Anybody? The main countries contributing to, to the, to the emissions. The first one is right now. Depends. Your question is in a cumulative way, uh, from beginning of the industrial revolution to now, is a United States. No, I mean positive, contributing positive uh, in the contribute to reduce the pollution. Who are the main countries? In, uh, Hard to that. know. Actually, I would not say one single one. All yeah. countries, with a very few exceptions of small economies like Sweden, you know, are reducing. China, the INDC of China, is not to reduce emissions, but to increase the efficiency of energy use. So they have uh, 1.5 billion people that do not have access properly to food and energy. So they will increase their emissions, and their emissions are increasing by 10% a year. It's very large. So basically, no country is actually reducing emissions right now, unfortunately, uh, significant countries. So United States is increasing. Europe is increasing a little bit, 2% uh, increase from 2018 to 17, and developing countries are increasing significantly. Africa, India, China, and also Brazil. So Sweden is not 
<laughs> yes, no. <laughs> 10 million people. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy to be here and, pre uh, and share with you my finding about forecasting monsoon and insight from nonlinear dynamics. Actually, when I'm talking about forecasting, it's not potential possibility, let me say. But this is actually what I'm doing last three years on a regular basis. So I'm doing this. And uh, let me explain what is about. I start... Uh, from first word, forecasting, then I turn to uh, monsoon, and then about the methodology which I use for forecast. So, as we uh, hear from the previous talk, it's very difficult to predict, especially future, according to Niels Bohr. But it's a general statement, and let us see uh, how it works in some particular <laughs> cases. For example, all of you know very well Edward Lawrence's uh, uh, result about uh, high sensitivity of initial condition on uh, result of uh, trajectory. Small change in initial condition can lead dramatical change. So uh, you know this very well, but I would like to invite you to look into details. This one. To look into details. As you can see, in the beginning, trajectory match. They are very close. And then it starts to diverge. And then diverge dramatically. But the question is, how long they match? They are very close to each other. In this particular experiment of Edward Lawrence, there is a his result. It's actually six days. But this is not real uh, meteorological model. In real meteorological model, it also would be from two days to 10 days. This is why numerical weather prediction has a limit to forecast uh, for up to approximately 10 days and no more. After that, trajectory just diverge. And this is why after that you have some kind of probabilistic forecast that it's very often nothing to do with reality. So 10 days, this is a limit of predictability, but reliable one, two days. What should we do with this? Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, forecasting of Indian monsoon. Forecasting, that means prediction. But let me describe a little bit system. So uh, monsoon, actually, this is a two meaning of monsoon. One is a uh, wind with, uh, which blow from ocean to land and reverse, in reverse order. And another one, there is a rainy season. In India, they call it monsoon. But in other country, I, I, uh, in Brazil, I think you call it it's, as a rainy season that starts from October to April, isn't that? So it's also in Africa, in the Australia, in um, China. Actually, most, uh, almost half of world population live in monsoon area. And uh, uh, as we know very well, that uh, it's rainy season strongly affects agriculture. And agriculture, uh, they need to know uh, one month in advance to, uh, to make uh, agriculture plan when this uh, season starts. This is why it's very important social problem. So 
Let me explain you on Indian monsoon system, uh, how it works. So actually, this is two branch of monsoon. One is going from Arabian Sea and another one from Bay of Bengal. And this, um, uh, these two branch provide this uh, amount of rainfall during the summer over Indian subcontinent. I will tell you physical basis a little bit later. And then, as you can see, uh, this is a isochron uh, that provided by Indian Meteorological Department about onset of monsoon, the beginning of rainy season, and uh, end of uh, the season, withdrawal of monsoon. As you can see, monsoon start not simultaneously over the Indian subcontinent and start from different dates in different um, uh, part of the country. So it's, uh, of course, it's make it difficult to forecast. Let us consider this point, 20 north, 80 east. And this is a histogram, historical histogram uh, that monsoon could onset, date of monsoon onset. You can see it spent from uh, June 4th to 29 of June, one month. And then similar story about withdrawal of monsoon. It's actually also uh, 70 of September, 29 of October. Also uh, a month. So uh, this, this makes it difficult to forecast. Let us uh, uh, a little bit, um, I will give you information about physics of the, pro of the process. So uh, monsoon is a result of differential heating between water and land. Land uh, heating faster and stronger. This is why uh, moisture coming from ocean to land. And in the winter, it's just in the opposite order. Uh, land became very cold very fast, and then uh, wind changed the direction. This is a, a theory of Edmund Haley that it's uh, true and working around uh, uh, every area where the monsoon exists. But now, let us talk about tropics. What's going on around tropics? So this is around uh, area around tropics that is called intratropical convergence zone. Intratropical convergence zone, the position of intratropical convergence zone, March, uh, March uh, equator uh, on equinox, Mar March 22. But then due to uh, Earth's inclination, uh, Earth's axis inclination, it's going to up, up 23.5 degree to, uh, to uh, north. For example, for India, it's close to Himalaya. And then uh, in, uh, after September, it's going down uh, to Australia, South Africa, and to Brazil. So this is why you have uh, monsoon from October to April, because this area, uh, actually this is the most moisture place of the planet, and because two patterns of wind, one from the north and another from south, merge, and there is a very low pressure system, and there is a maximum moisture place on the planet. So this is how global monsoon is working. So there's, it seems that we understand everything about the monsoon. Why it's so difficult to forecast? So uh, my question, I found this definition. The onset of monsoon is not a transition from regime of no rain to rain. It's transition from regime of sporadic rainfall to specially organized and tempor temporarily sustainable rainfall. So I'm a nonlinear person. So I, my expertise in bifurcation. When I found this definition, I immediately think about bifurcation. What should I propose? I could propose to add one single word in this definition. Uh, maybe, might be, is critical transition. Let us try to find out. So let us consider temperature. There is a uh, temperature during one year in this part of Indian uh, subcontinent, right here in central India. So the uh, violet line, there is the average, five years average, and uh, for example, 2017, this is the current year. You can see fluctuation in temperature here. So is it critical transition? Might be, but might be not. 
but how, how to treat this problem. So then I decide to make a following. Let us assume if no monsoon in this area, how temperature should be in this way. Now we can see that temperature growing, stable to pass maximum, and then drop down, and then uh, stay in the some level during monsoon season. Then I can try to distinguish two different stable states in the system. One stable state is a monsoon system. It's actually temperature around 27 degree during whole period of time. And another pre-monsoon. I uh, remove this part and this part as everything is in theoretical physics I just will consider only transition from uh, highest temperature pre-monsoon system to mon uh, monsoon system. Okay, uh, how can we describe this? Okay, it may, might be possible to make using this equation, well no equation of nonlinear oscillator with uh, asymmetric potential. In this uh, way we have sudden node bifurcation here and this transritical bifurcation. So my first stable state right here when temperature saturate and this is a state of monsoon. So my uh, task to predict when it happens when temperature past this critical threshold. So this is hypothesis, and let us see how we can treat this. So uh, in the past I was working with a lot from uh, fluctuation. Uh, uh, at the beginning it was several paper by uh, Kurt Weisenfeld who shows that fluctuation uh, uh, grows close to the bifurcation point uh, in uh, infinitely. But in uh, our paper, you can see that we have shown that it's not going infinite. It's actually saturated. Saturated on the special level uh, that dependent on noise on the system. You can found estimation in these papers. And then many people try to use this uh, increase in fluctuation or increase in the correlation time uh, at approaching bifurcation threshold. It's early warning indicator. You can see thousand uh, paper about early warning indicator and it's really true fluctuation grow uh, at, the uh, at the beginning of uh, abrupt transition and also smooth transition also. But you can see that it's growing and for example, for technical system, it's very good. For example, for combustor, uh, before the thermoacoustic instability, you can just stop engine. And it's really a very good indicator. But in climate, we cannot stop system. We, have, we would like to know when it happened. So if you found an internet, no one can able to say. Everything about early, uh, pre, uh, early in, uh, warning indicator, this is in the past by data but no any prediction in future. And this is one of the evidence, uh, uh, actually 25 author 2014, they study ecological system and found that we do not yet have an example when early warning indicator were used to avert upcoming shift. They have been used in model experiment or retrospectively. So, in, uh, so in contrast to use early warning indicator to predict time, uh, uh, I propose the following way, to predict place, geographical location, when critical condition originate. So critical condition cannot uh, originate around the whole Indian subcontinent. They appear somewhere, then it's growing, then it's propagate. So let us try, how, how we can do this? So uh, how to, there is a two questions. Where uh, geographically critical condition originate and how do critical condition propagate in space? So I'm going to uh, uh, show you uh, the, as example, very short fragment of the movie. It's called Treasure of San Gennaro. Uh, very quickly about the story, this American gangsters in Italy enlist local gang to help him to steal uh, treasure of San Gennaro. And let us see what happens. The My one 
domanda ci avete messo? E tu come sei arrivato qua? Io niente, ho visto uscire questa volta, lasciata aperta la porta e io sono entrato. During cold night he tried to do this. Pay attention. The method is well known. I mean, try and error. There is a uh, sound festival in the city. This is why he listening radio. No people on the street. Everyone on the concert. Pay attention. So it was just lighter. Now. Oops. And you can see, and you can see sometimes it works, but we need methodology to find place where critical condition originate. How to make it? So for that, I, I introduce the following, uh, let me say, terminology. So uh, there is a uh, term, te, term uh, tipping, uh, it's multi-meaning term. And I use the following. The tipping, it's overbalance or cause to overbalance. For example, the hay caught fire when candle tipped over. The candle is origin of the problem, a tipping element of the system. The time when candle tipped over, it's tipping point, it's data when it happens, uh, time, hour, minute. And let us open the window in room when this candle located. It gives, it, it gives a direction of flame propagation. And then open it window, it's another tipping element. So. What should, uh, how to find these two tipping elements? We used data. Uh, data and Sepankari analysis and error entry. So what we did, we analyzed variance of fluctuation. Variance of fluctuation in near surface air temperature. Near surface air temperature, this is 100 meter uh, on the surface. So, and this is just sigma f of uh, daily uh, near surface temperature. And you can see uh, two weeks before onset of monsoon, we have highest fluctuation in three regions. Then we have a two uh, region. And finally, one day before onset of monsoon, we have very high fluctuation uh, in two regions. Why? What is it? Is it tipping element or what? Why, uh, how, how to explain this? But from meteorological perspective, it's uh, not surprising that high fluctuation appears there. Why? Because there is a uh, branch of Arabian Sea, uh, branch of monsoon is going from this direction and coming here. So this is a branch from Arabian Sea. They merge 
and produce the strongest cyclone during cyclone because it uh, take power from two sources. And this is the highest temperature on the Indian subcontinent uh, at that moment. And this is why all moisture coming to this place. So first, this is the first tipping element. We call it Eastern Ghats. But another tipping element right here in North Pakistan. What's going on in North Pakistan? Actually, there is a uh, area when monsoon ceases to exist, no monsoon, uh, real monsoon in North Pakistan. However, there is a place when it appears so-called Western disturbance. This is an anti-cyclone there. So two systems interact, cyclone in Eastern Ghats and anti-cyclone in um, North Pakistan, all together, they produced beginning of rain, onset of monsoon right here in uh, Eastern Ghats. So one is a cyclone, so uh, we see uh, high uh, fluctuation inside of the cyclone, and another inside of the anticyclone. This is why we can see this two uh, area. And then, but it's not enough. What, what is this information? How it help us to uh, make any forecast, make any prediction? And we found one more uh, feature. There is a feature, this again, North Pakistan in Eastern Ghats, uh, it was revealed by network approach. But now, let us see, this is just distribution, that's the value near surface air temperature. Two weeks before onset of monsoon, one week before onset of monsoon in Eastern Ghats, in this point, 2080. And you can see only 80, the temperature between Eastern Ghats in North Pakistan equalizes on some point on the, the day of onset of monsoon. And then it diverges again. So maybe it's accident, but this is the average. Average from 1951 to 2015. So, but now let us look inside of this two region, what we can see. And now I'll show you real forecast for 2018, what I have uh, made the uh, 7th of May. So this is temperature in Eastern Ghats. So it's fam uh, familiar to you from uh, pre previous slides. So, and this is the temperature in Eastern Ghats 2018 until 7 of May. This is in North Pakistan. North Pakistan is more north. This is why temperature lower. So what's going on? No, in North Pakistan, actually no monsoon. And this is why temperature going, then going maximum, then going back. But in Eastern Ghats, there is a monsoon, temperature growing, then it's saturated, then it's going down, and uh, hold one uh, value during the monsoon season. What we can see, because temperature in Eastern Ghats follow down, they intersect. They intersect in, in this date. In this date, just few days, one, two, maximum three days. And then, we have checked, it happens every year. And it's not surprising, because uh, temperature, uh, monsoon coming every year in Eastern Ghats, and temperature in North Pakistan also growing because of uh, increasing uh, daily light hours. And moreover, in it, this intersection happens twice. One, it's the beginning of onset of monsoon, and another one, the withdrawal of monsoon right here. So what we can do, we, so now we have more information. We have a two reference point, two critical element. We have some relation between them. Now let us try to predict. Let us assume that we have only one critical uh, tipping element, Eastern Ghats. So temperature growing, fluctuation growing here in this region. So uh, in this period of time, pre-monsoon season, but we're not able to say when it's going down. It's just theoretically impossible. However, we have a North Pakistan. In this period of time, temperature in North Pakistan growing in a linear way, just linear way. And this is why we can see on 7th of May get trend from North Pakistan from here and 
calculate how many days it takes from uh, in uh, North Pakistan for temperature to increase till critical point. This is we have found by average right here. And then predict onset of monsoon in Eastern Ghats. So the second tipping element is necessary for prediction. And then similar way possible, this is again real forecast that I made 13 of July 18, uh, 2000, uh, 2018. You can see this temperature uh, again intersect, but then one more feature, actually temperature growing with the same trend like the temperature uh, uh, going down. So this is one more feature of whole this system. So it helped from maximum to calculate. Actually, this is a theoretical point. Temperature never going uh, so high. But this is a theoretical point of trend that I can calculate how many days it takes for uh, temperature in North Pakistan to de de decrease another critical point here for withdrawal data. So we have a here sudden node bifurcation. This we have a smooth transition. Smooth transition. So we um, test our methodology. From 1951 to 2015, uh, we test onset and withdrawal day with 74% of success rate for onset of monsoon and 84% for withdrawal of monsoon. And after that, and it was published in this paper, so uh, you can see uh, this publication in geophysical research later. And after that, Indian Meteorological Department asked us, you have published paper, please forecast it. So <laughs> we didn't expect it. So I had never expected I'm going to spend some part of my life for this kind of task. So finally, this is a, a monsoon page monsoon page on uh, Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, when I published all this forecast from 2016. So finally, there is a uh, seven forecast from 2016. I will show you uh, one of them, 2018, that I show you as example. So this is uh, June 15, it was my forecast. 40 days in advance, 40 days in advance. As you remember, meteorological limit 10 days. And IMD Indian period meteorological department forecast two weeks in advance. So I'm doing this 40 days in advance. And you can see that um, temperature in Eastern Ghats reached this critical threshold in the frame of forecast. Uh, uh, and then this drawal date 80 days in advance. In the end of July, I predict that uh, monsoon withdrawal from the central part of India, October 8, plus minus five days. So it was also successful. And let me see, uh, let me show you some evidence right here. So this is uh, uh, is a chrome uh, green line produced by Indian Meteorological Dep Department by fact when monsoon uh, onset uh, appear already. And it, uh, as you can see, this is a chrome going through the, my square of prediction. But actually, my prediction going more. It's from here to here, this part of India. And this is withdrawal date. You can also see the same date from 13 to 21 of October. Monsoon completely withdrawal from this area. From this, this is completely withdrawal from this area. It was also correct. So. Uh, Indian Meteorological Department um, recognize and acknowledge all my uh, seven forecasts as successful. So it's possible, it works, it works. And uh, this is uh, some, um, one of the newspaper, but it's really very important for India, and this is why uh, it's uh, a lot of attention in India to this forecast. Actually, methodologies that I proposed uh, possible to use in another uh, monsoon system and in Africa and Brazil as well. And uh, we are working on this. And uh, 
So 40 days in advance onset, 80 day, days in advance withdrawal, this is what we can do. So this prediction is possible, but it's not model prediction. It's not prediction by model. It's prediction by data. But this data um, prediction scheme based completely on nonlinear dynamics base. And this is why I found it's very exciting to share it with you here. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And this is the references you can find here. Microphone. Uh, very nice talk. Thanks. Thank you. Will you, will you method help in predicting also the formation of cyclones around the world, which are the real, <laughs> the real so, bad stuff? <laughs> actually, a cyclone, a prediction of cyclone, now is very well developed, very well very well developed. And meteorological department around the world and in India and in United States, I don't know, in Brazil, the very good system. This is another time scale. Life time of cyclone is one week. One week, 10 days maximum. And they able to, actually, you can also see some, uh, there is a, some um, website you can see when it's appear in any point of uh, planet of Earth. And uh, they can calculate direction and how many days it takes to come and uh, intensity. It's done. It's done. But this, it, it's impossible to say when it started. This is just impossible because this is, is in previous talk, atmosphere is very mixed, chaotic system, very mixed. But sometimes some regular pattern appear like cyclone, anti-cyclone, etc. But it appears really by fluctuation. It's not any regularities. But monsoon is regular system coming every year. This is why it's possible. Just we have to find which kind of regularities. But these regularities, critical temperature, for every location of Indian subcontinent. In uh, Brazil, it would be also critical temperature for every location. And then we have to solve this problem again. It's not going automatically. This is why I'm not able to make uh, monsoon around the global immediately. So I have to unravel these connections. And when it's uh, done, so then it's possible to make forecast. It's a correct connection for you? I don't think so. It's all. So let us yeah, have you. It's my. If you have this. I think it's not this one. This one. Try to see. It's all. This is. This should work. So. Why should I? Should I start? Okay. Okay. So uh, 
thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me for this meeting. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, new stuff that uh, many of us have been working on in uh, turbulent flows. And hopefully, you know, given that this is a sort of a mixed audience, hopefully I will give, uh, try to, you know, spend a few minutes in giving some context to, uh, to our work. All right. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, in general, uh, the, uh, the study of homogeneous isotropic turbulence sort of goes back to the framework of uh, Kolmogorov in 1941. And within that sort of framework, uh, one of the things which did come out of that was uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the energy, uh, the uh, kinetic energy distributed across scales in turbulence follows a certain law which is, uh, you know, popularly known as the K minus five third law. And more uh, sort of critically, uh, Kolmogorov's sort of theory uh, ended up with a prediction for how the uh, correlators of uh, the velocity fluctuations in a turbulent flow should scale as R, how, uh, as, as the spatial scale over which these uh, correlations are measured. However, as we know, since uh, the 1940s, because of uh, simulations and experiments and observations, uh, that uh, Kolmogorov's prediction of a certain linear scaling of the correlation function actually breaks down in turbulence. And the jargon that's sort of, uh, you know, the lore uh, that's uh, popular in the community is that this is all attributable to what's known as intermittency in turbulent signals. So uh, a sort of way to visualize this actually, you know, goes to uh, Srini's paper in the old days, which, for example, if I were to look at the time series of the energy dissipation field as a function of time, things don't look smooth. There are, uh, there are spikes and there are sort of uh, regions where uh, you hardly see any activity. And all this sort of tends to boil down into breaking uh, essentially this uh, prediction of Kolmogorov, the exponent for any pth order correlator, which should have been linearly scaling. Measurements show that it is nonlinear. And, and this sort of nonlinearity in the exponents of uh, turbulent correlation functions is still sort of one of the, uh, well, uh, since I work in the field, one of the more important uh, sort of problems in theoretical physics. And I would emphasize that intermittency is what it's attributable to. Uh, of course, there are other fingerprints of turbulent flows, which are sort of great examples of uh, non-equilibrium stationary states. And as we all know, the flows are chaotic. Uh, they are irreversible. There's a macroscopic, <coughs> excuse me, energy dissipation, <coughs> and it's intermittent, which essentially shows up in these. For example, if I'm looking at the vorticity field in a turbulent flow, you have regions of extreme vorticity lying next to regions where there is basically nothing. Or uh, in every measurable that you can think of, this is the famous sort of measurement in uh, Bodinshard's group, which has to do with the acceleration statistics of a turbulent flow. Uh, you could measure the velocity fluctuations. Everything that you see is hardly Gaussian. And that makes sort of theory uh, rather difficult. And in recent years, you know, I, uh, given the first two talks, I really should have been talking about aerosols and microphysics of clouds in this session, but I'm not. Uh, but, but recently, we've sort of also looked uh, at the fact that the intermittent effects of turbulence shows up in more sort of realistic or, or, or you know, applied problems which have to do with how uh, water droplets in a warm cloud coalesce and build bigger aggregates. So it's not really, in that sense, an academic problem only for theoretical physicists, but it actually has uh, deep uh, reasons. Okay, uh, so uh, one of the uh, sort of uh, goals uh, that has been around for 30 odd years has been to understand where these signatures of turbulent flows come in. And I'm just sort of uh, historically, uh, again, a short talk, but uh, I think uh, just for completeness, I should add uh, that there have been various models either based on the velocity or the dissipation field or more phenomenological models which have tried to see uh, the fact that uh, how these departures from Kolmogorov's sort of linear scaling ideas show up. Uh, what I should add is that most of these models, including the sort of well-known frisch parisi model of multifactorial formalism, are actually, in, in that sense, phenomenological models. They don't necessarily, essentially derive from the equations of motion. So in recent years, uh, uh, some of us have been involved in developing a new approach 
uh, which we call uh, Fourier decimation, and and we'll uh, I'll sort of introduce this a little because even you know uh, to the turbulence community this uh, this this may not be that uh, that obvious. So with that sort of uh, let me sort of quickly give a little background to this, and just for reference, uh, the first papers uh, were uh, with uh, Uriel, Anna, and Itamar, and then recently my student Ritwik also worked on it. So what's the idea? So let me sort of do a flowchart of this as quickly and as uh, unambiguously as I can. So a starting point would be the incompressible Euler or the Navier-Stokes equation, depending on whether you're a mathematician or a physicist, I suppose. Uh, what uh, we do is we can define a generalized projection, which is, you know, I, I take the velocity field and I look at its Fourier components and I multiply each of them with a factor gamma k. Gamma k is one with a certain probability and one minus hk with uh, the other. And this leads to either a projected Euler equation with this projection across the nonlinear term or a projected Navier Stokes equation. All right, so I should add that you know, the earlier studies go back to uh, Mark Brasher and others in the mid 2000s. So, in general, one can do an absolute projection where I choose hk to be 1 or 0. So that means there's a hard cutoff, and so I constrain my effective degrees of freedom up to a given wave number and not more. So all modes exist up to a given wave number, and then there is nothing. Or I could sort of decimate, which is essentially I could choose this hk, again, it's all given there, such that it can scale as a power in k. And and so if I begin with a certain small d dimensional equation, two dimension, three dimension, then I choose these factors with a certain probability, k, my, uh, k to the d minus k, or I can do it homogeneously on a lattice. So I go to each point in my Fourier lattice, since I've expanded my field in that Fourier lattice, and I ascribe a probability whether a certain Fourier mode exists or not. All right, so in general, this is the idea that you know, statistical physicists are familiar with. It is introducing a quenched disorder on my lattice in which I'm going to solve the equations of motion. Uh, the important thing here is, you know, uh, I, I won't go through the uh, maths right now, but uh, happy to discuss later, is that given that this is really a Hermitian projector, the conservation laws remain unchanged. So I can begin in any d-dimensional uh, system, and I can reduce either my dimension or homogeneously my degrees of freedom with the same conservation laws. Uh, and, and, and I just uh, like, uh, like to sort of mention a quick digression. The reason people st we started playing with this was to answer a question about whether there is an interface of equilibrium solutions in the Navier-Stokes equation with non-equilibrium solutions. And the goal really was, I mean, just so that it, it doesn't appear very mystic why we are playing this bizarre game, the goal really was to, uh, to, to ask if there are any special critical dimensions where the equipartition spectrum coincides with Kolmogorov scaling. So for example, equipartition would mean that the kinetic energy is equally distributed in three dimensions. This would be an energy spectrum k squared, but we know Kolmogorov theory says it has to be k minus 5 third, as is also shown by experiments. Uh, and, and, and then uh, one is able to come up with a critical dimension 4 third, where all of this sort of falls in place. All right, so, so this is the background in which this whole sort of uh, industry uh, grew, which was, in a sense, to find a critical dimension such that you can begin with real turbulence, turbulence on a soap film, turbulence in a wind tunnel, and then try to come uh, mathematically and numerically to a critical dimension where real turbulence sort of coincides with what you would have got if there were only fluxes, absolute equilibrium uh, solutions in the problem. All right, so with that sort of background about the, uh, about the way the problem is set up, let me sort of quickly uh, address uh, the, the couple of questions that I want to discuss. So uh, I'll go slow on the results. So it, it really, you know, if people are interested, uh, we could discuss over the next uh, two or three days. Uh, but just to give you a flavor of what we are doing. So again, I begin with the Navier-Stokes equation in three dimension. I solve it on a quenched disordered lattice and I solve it on lattices which are decimated fractally so that the number of degrees of freedom scales with k and you have an effective dimension in the problem. Or I could do it 
in a homogeneously decimated lattice and try and play the same game. So the first thing that one sort of notices in these decimated flows, so that's an example of a three-dimensional flow, the vortex filaments, is that as soon as one reduces the effective degrees of freedom, you see that slowly the small-scale structures, the highly intermittent sort of vortical tubes, starts to disappear. But I should emphasize that this is still turbulence in the sense that you still have the k minus 5 thirds scaling of the energy spectrum. Here I'm showing what's known as the compensated spectrum in, in our uh, jargon, which is I've multiplied the energy spectrum with the k minus 5 thirds, just to show that a Plato shows that this is really still turbulent. Uh, however, what happens is, if I start, I, I'm going to show just a couple of measurements just to emphasize uh, the point of this talk, uh, is, for example, if I were to measure the kurtosis of the vorticity field, in three dimensions, we know that the kurtosis is not three. If it was a purely Gaussian field, if uh, uh, solutions of Navier-Stokes were just random Gaussian sort of uh, variables where central limit theorem, et cetera, holds, it would be three. However, in real turbulence, the number is much higher. It's greater than 10, actually. It scales with Reynolds. However, the minute I sort of remove certain modes, and I'm showing you just as a percentage of modes that I'm removing, the kurtosis immediately sort of drops to 3. So things are starting to become Gaussian and yet turbulent. This gives hope for theorists who want, you know, where Gaussian fields are easier to play with. That's an Eulerian signature, the vorticity field. What about the Lagrangian signatures of this? So by Lagrangian, I mean I put tracer particles in my flow and I track them, just as I would look at an Eulerian field with a camera sitting uh, outside my equipment. So in the Lagrangian framework, I can again sort of try to understand what the kurtosis is of, let's say, the Lagrangian structure function. So essentially, I can look at, uh, I can uh, track a certain uh, tracer along the flow, and I can look at the velocity, something which is similar to the velocity autocorrelation function. So I look at the velocity difference over time increment star, and that scales with a certain exponent, which is uh, a family of exponents which are well known. If I look at the flatness of the kurtosis, again, I find that the minute I reduce the number of degrees of freedom, and, and keep in mind that it's just 0.05, so in the whole set of triads which form the nonlinear term u dot grad u, I am just removing 0.05% of those triads. And immediately, the field starts to become Gaussian. Again, uh, you know, in case uh, uh, for a more mathematical description, we sort of looked at it for the Burgers equation, which is uh, theoretically easier to handle. And uh, I think we have an explanation of why uh, the, this happens. Uh, the good thing is uh, that the bridge relations which connect Eulerian and Lagrangian fields seem to, be, uh, seem to obey in, in, in this framework. Uh, what about the last bit of the puzzle in, in turbulent flows, which has to do with irreversibility, in particular, Lagrangian irreversibility? So one of the things one uh, you know, uh, has done, and these are some of the early references. I mean, the first one is early. Uh, already 13 years now, is our ability to measure the Lyapunov ex uh, exponents along Lagrangian trajectories. So essentially, I can follow individual Lagrangian trajectories, calculate the velocity gradients along the flow, and come up with the three Lyapunov exponents in a 3D flow which characterize my uh, solutions. So in general, the Lyapunov exponents are ordered, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. The Lagrangian field is chaotic, so the first Lyapunov exponent is always positive, and it has a certain universal value. It scales with the so-called Kolmogorov time scale of the flow. Uh, the middle one is just a little positive to show that the flow is irreversible. If the middle one was zero, then lambda three and lambda one would balance each other, and you could play the movie backwards. It's not surprising, that the fact that the flow is irreversible. I'll, I'll show you what's surprising in a minute, because I have a Laplacian dissipated term, so the flow has to be sort of uh, uh, irreversible. When we try to measure the Lyapunov exponent in the decimated case, and this is you know, both homogeneous and fractal, it really doesn't matter, what we found was that the level of chaos, sort of the blue is what you 
uh, the blue band is from all measurements, experimental and numerical for three-dimensional flows. What we found was, as you decimate, the level of uh, the degree of chaos really doesn't change. However, what happens is, if you look at the middle exponent, which is a sort of measure of the irreversibility of the flow, of course, it still stays irreversible. It's still uh, positive, but there's a sharp drop. So there is a certain emergent reversibility in this flow, which, which needs to be understood. And again, why is it that all the triads contribute to making the problem, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the actual problem of Navier-Stokes so uh, untrackable? Uh, there is another way, and this is a more recent work, which, has to, which again looks at the reversibility in a Lagrangian setting which has to do with the flight crash events in turbulence. So let me go through this a little slowly because this is quite a, uh, Nilima, I have about five minutes, right? Yeah, so uh, because this is uh, certainly something uh, rather interesting. So, oh, good. So, so what happens is I feed my flow with a tracer and I follow the particle and I measure its energy along its trajectory. What, uh, what, the, what the group here found was that since it's in non-equilibrium stationary state, the average energy doesn't change, of course. But as you follow the trajectory, you see that although the energy increases gradual, there's a sharp fall when it loses energy. And this is sort of zoomed in here and color coded with the power, which is just the DE dt. And you see that there is a gradual flight of these particles as they gather energy, and then there's a sharp crash. All right, so we wanted to sort of look at this problem more carefully, and this is another way of looking at the same picture, which is you can take, uh, you can measure the PDFs of the power, and you see a certain skewness, so the left tail is reflected, so it's still positive, and you see that for different Reynolds number, the dashed line is the left tail, it's always above the red line, which is for the positive tail. So essentially it shows that the power PDF is skewed in, 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 in turbulence, again, power PDF measured along the trajectories of individual traces. Uh, and then this allows uh, one to sort of uh, uh, come up with a certain measure of irreversibility, essentially the skewness of this power PDF with a minus sign for convenience, where you do see that this is really positive and the skewness increases with Reynolds number. Should point out that uh, uh, colleagues in Bangalore, Rahul Pandit's group also have looked at this uh, for, for uh, heavy particles. So why, did we, why do we revisit this flight crash problem? The reason is, can we bridge the Eulerian and Lagrangian frameworks? And second, what was implicit in the PNS paper was that somehow there is an association between small scale intermittency, the fact that you have these rare intermittent structures and irreversibility. So what Jason, uh, who's a postdoc in our group and uh, soon be joining IIT Bombay as a faculty member, so what Jason and I were interested in was to look at the dissipation field. So this is a dissipation field from a three-dimensional flow. Blue is regions which are extremely dissipative, so it's, I think, six times more than the average dissipation. Under decibation, so we've... Uh, removed of just a few modes, you see that these blue regions disappear. So if the conjecture that flight crashes happen only because there are these strong Eulerian intermittent structures that a Lagrangian particle faces along its way, it shouldn't show up when you decimate. Also, what, what we found was the fact that the statistics of dissipation changes from log normal, which is well known in three-dimensional flows, to things which are much more exponential under decimation. So we, what, uh, we went ahead and measured the PDF, the same PDF. So uh, uh, black is exactly for three-dimensional flows, consistent with earlier measurements and experiments. And red and blue are for cases where I have homogeneously decimated, so that's alpha. Uh, and what we see is, again, the dashed line lies above the unbroken line. So our field is still negatively skewed. That's good. So then, are these sort of flight crash events really linked to intermittent structures? Because I've taken a synthetic turbulent flow where I've got rid of small scale activity, and yet I come up with the same sort of irreversibility picture. To understand this, what we, uh, what we looked at is to condition the PDF of P 
based on whether the trajectory is in a region of extreme events. So the red shows when it's only in places in the Eulerian flow where the dissipation is six times more than the average. The, blue, uh, the green is when it's in regions which is less than the average. And blue is what people would normally sort of measure in, in an experiment. You see something rather curious. If you look at the red, the dashed line remains below the, uh, the solid line. So here, actually, the negative skewness is lost. So this is really counterintuitive in the sense that for in regions which in the Eulerian sense are strongly intermittent, the Lagrangian particles, if they were just confined there, would not lose energy, but would actually gain energy. This is rather strange, because you would expect that the particle to dissipate energy in these basins of strong dissipation, right? So what we uh, were able to do is essentially sort of to say that the flights, uh, the, the trajectories actually don't flight crash, but actually take off in these sort of regions. So how do we understand this? In the last sort of couple of minutes, I'll uh, give, a, give a persuasive argument, I hope, and we can discuss the details later, is in the following sense. We can measure power approximately as the, uh, so this is just the uh, one over uh, the change in energy along, of a kinetic energy along the particle trajectory. That's roughly equal to epsilon and u dot grad p, where grad p is the pressure gradient in the flow. Right? So if we measure the distribution of this u dot grad p, what we immediately notice is in regions which are strongly intermittent in the conventional sense, u dot grad p has disproportionately large values. When, when, uh, for green, which are in regions which are calm and quiescent, the distribution is much narrower. Then if you actually go ahead and look at the angle between the velocity of the fluid and the gradient of the negative gradient of pressure, you see that in regions of large uh, extreme re uh, uh, regions of extreme statistics, you see that u starts aligning with the gradient of pressure. So what's really happening, and, I, and I'm nearly done here, what's really happening is the following. OK, good. <laughs> What's really happening is the following, that contrary to what one would have expected, particles, when they are in regions where there are strong small-scale intermittency, are also regions where the gradient of pressure acts in a negative way. So essentially, a particle in the quieter regions of the flow dissipates strongly. And the minute it enters these sort of regions of the flow where there is a lot of small scale activity, and hence large epsilon, which is really the Laplacian of U, they speed up. And, and, and this, to us, was very surprising, and it still remains rather surprising to us. So what happens when you put all of that together? And this is really my last plot, uh, Nilima. Uh, what happens when you put all of that together is if you measure the same irreversibility for a 3D flow without worrying about where you are or trying to understand where this number is coming from, you end up with a number blue, consistent with the PNS results. However, if you actually condition it on only places where there are extreme small scale events, you see the sign changes. It's actually not a flight crash event at all, but it's really a takeoff kind of scenario. It has to be compensated. So if, if you, again, condition it on regions which are quiet and calm, you see a greater degree of irreversibility there. And then, of course, given the flavor of uh, decimation, which is sort of the overarching theme of my talk here, if you sort of measure it as you change the number of effective degrees of freedom you have in a sort of RG sense, you see that the irreversibility remains. It is irreversible, but it saturates consistent with the Lyapunov measurements we have. So that brings me to the conclusions of the talk. And what I would like to uh, highlight is that, the def uh, that this decimated trick that we've been using seems to be particularly fertile to sort of uh, uh, arrive at critical dimensions, which are useful to study equilibrium and non-equilibrium physics in Navier-Stokes. That sounds a misnomer. It isn't, as, 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 as we had seen. And it sort of allows us to kind of do, for example, perturbation theories around this problem. Uh, so I'll just leave with the perspectives. I won't read it out so that there's time for question. 
And just one small uh, comment, which has to do with the fully truncated Invisit system, which I did not talk about. Uh, this system, which has thermalized solution, and Pablo has also worked on this quite a bit, is actually now turning out to be very useful to look at weak solutions of the Euler equations, as well as study many body chaos in thermalized problems, which is, again, something very popular in the last few years, thanks to quantum field theories. So I'll, 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 I'll end there and take questions. Thank you. One question after which we can discuss outside. Yeah. Yes. So when you truncate your system, if you look for a dimension in which you have the same spectrum as Cornwall or what do you get in the flux? Uh, the flux uh, starts to vanish. Uh, within the EDQNM closure approximations, you can actually come up with a theory. We never published that, which shows that the flux vanishes linearly with uh, uh, d minus the critical dimension. So you do see a vanishing flux, so it really is. There's a subtle issue about is the field really Gaussian, which we can discuss, because as you know, that puts into trouble von karman howard type relations. Yeah, so, so in that case, you, are, you actually have an equilibrium, right? Yes. Exactly, and, and that sort of nicely explains Kreitman's results about inverse cascades. Uh, it really shows how it depends, uh, how it changes with the dimension deficit. Yes. Uh, okay, we can talk later. Yeah.